The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is a collaborative project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies and the International House Global Voices Program. Our nationally recognized programming is made possible with support from listeners like you. Secure the future of World Beyond the Headlines programming by making your gift online at alumniservices.uchicago.edu slash giving. Please specify World Beyond the Headlines as the area of giving. The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is supported by the McCormick Foundation, the Norman Wade Harris Fund, and generous contributions from listeners like you. Thank you very much and welcome to all of you. Nice that you could make it out tonight. It's a great honor for me and a pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Gilles Doronceau. He's a in normal life, we might say, professor of political science uh, in Paris at the Sorbonne, uh, Université de Paris 1, right? Sorbonne, uh, quoi? Uh, Panthéon, Sorbonne Panthéon. Very complicated system they have there. But for uh, two years, he is on a, uh, in a visiting scholar position at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington, working, of course, on Afghanistan. Uh, he is the author of a highly acclaimed book entitled Afghanistan, Revolution Unending, which was published in 2005 by Columbia University Press and Hearst Publishers in the UK. And he's also the uh, f co founder of an online multidisciplinary journal called SAMAJ, or at least the acronym for its name is SAMAJ, S A M A J, which covers the region from Afghanistan to Bangladesh. Uh, and as Jamie said in her First introduction, uh, his talk tonight will be on the consequences of the escalation of war in Afghanistan. Please join me in welcoming Gilles de Ronsoro. Thank you, Fred, for your generous introduction. Um, thank you for all the institution that made this, uh, this presentation possible. I I'm not sure I'm going to to, uh, to tell you again all the institutions, but I think I forgot a few. But uh, let me uh, start this uh, this presentation with the headlines, actually, because it's supposed to be beyond the headlines, but it's, it's useful to start with the headlines. So uh, uh, first thing, uh, you've, you've probably watched on TV or you've seen newspaper, there was a big offensive in Marja in Afghanistan. Marja uh, is supposed to be... <coughs> Uh, should be uh, west uh, of Lashkarga in the district of Nadali. And uh, this is a big success because the Taliban were uh, basically uh, beaten and they are now out of Marja. And uh, the, uh, the U.S. military thinks that it's possible to, to have a new, uh, new stability, uh, a new, new phase of reconstruction with what they call a government in a box means that they are, <coughs> they are sending uh, a new uh, district uh, uh, chief, a uh, new police, and from that uh, they hope to, uh, to, to get the trust of the, the local population. The second headline was about the arrest, maybe you remember that, a few weeks ago, of Mola Baradar, uh, who is, was, the number two of the, the Taliban leadership. He was the person in charge of the day-to-day -day, uh, management of the war. Uh, he was in contact with all the Taliban commander inside Afghanistan, so he was a key person. And he was arrested by the, uh, the Pakistani uh, Secret Services, the ISI. Uh, and from that, uh, we can interfere that maybe the American pressure on the Pakistani military and on the Pakistani government uh, are working because after Mullah Baroda, you have the arrest of four or five Taliban commanders, important people inside the Taliban movement. The, the, third, the third point was the London conference. You know, it was in uh, January. And uh, at this conference, there were two, two, uh, two important things that were said publicly. First, uh, we are going to Afghanize the war. And, uh, for example, we are going to have a new Afghan National Army uh, of uh, 250,000 uh, men, 
mostly men, not, uh, not many women, in uh, less than three years, starting from uh, 100,000 uh, right now. Same thing for the police, with uh, figures that are slightly different. And the second, uh, the second uh, point in this uh, London conference was uh, we are going to buy the Taliban, to buy off the Taliban. We are going to pay the Taliban to stop fighting. We are going to give them a job to reintegrate them in the system. So uh, basically it's a large amnesty with some kind of economical help for the Taliban, mostly the foot soldiers, who are ready to stop the fight. What's the idea beyond that is that it's after 2011, the, uh, the coalition of the US forces, but mostly the US forces, is going to withdraw slowly from Afghanistan and the Afghan National Army will be able to to secure Afghanistan progress, progressively. So, a lot of good news, all is well, so maybe you can stop here and, and have an early dinner. But at the same time, I have still 40, 40 minutes, so, uh, <laughs> well, what we are going to do now is to take all these points and, and discuss it. Yeah. And so we'll start with uh, the Marja Offensive, and uh, a larger, larger term with the problem of the counterinsurgency strategy. We have probably seen in, uh, in the newspaper that Marja was a city of 80,000 uh, inhabitants. And that is not the case. Marja is not a city. Marja is a series of villages uh, with a bazaar here and there, but not real center. So there was no real fight, real offensive, you know, it's not Stalingrad, it's not... Uh, uh, the Taliban have been beaten in a way, but they are still there, actually. They were not expelled. They, were, they, are, they are part of the population. They are still here. And I was, and a lot of people in Afghanistan were extremely surprised uh, when the U.S. military, the coalition, was explaining that Marja was a key, key thing in Afghanistan. Because, actually, a lot of Afghan people don't know where, is, where Marja is, actually. <laughs> because Marja is... Uh, I, I don't want to take uh, an example in this country because, of course, I'm not going to be lucky. And so let's take France. You know, it's a village in a, a little district in the center of France in Auvergne, you know, somewhere in the mountains. So I'm not sure it's that strategic. So my first question would be, is Marja a strategic place? And the answer is no, absolutely not. So the question is, why this big operation in Marja? So there is generally two, two arguments here. First argument, Marja is important because it's a key point for the logistic of the insurgency, logistic of the Taliban. But uh, actually, it's not the case. You know, look, uh, I'm going to show you on the map. When you're a Taliban, you're, you're, you're going through... Uh, I'm not absolutely sure that I'm showing the right place, but it's, at least it's Suruz Gan, and you're going north, north, north here. And you, you can, that's one of the way. Or you can go through here, Pakistan, and go. There is no border, really. Yeah, huh? It's desert, it's, you, it's open, you, you go where you want. So why should the Taliban, if it's Ashkarga here, why should the Taliban use this place to cross? I, I, I don't understand why. There is no reason. The, the road, the real road, is north. Okay? Or it is south, south here. Because here you can, uh, when you're dealing drugs and plenty of things, you can, you can go there. So the idea that by occupying Marja, we are going to, to, to make a huge progress against the Taliban is a strange idea. The second argument was about drugs. Uh, drugs are extremely important in Marja, actually. Uh, everybody is cultivating opium. But the point is that the government, Karzai government, people close to Karzai, are making much more money than the Taliban with opium. So the idea that the offensive in Marja is going to, to kill the, the, the Taliban because they will have no more money is deeply wrong. There is no empirical data. 
Uh, I'm very skeptical, generally speaking, about data, drugs-related data, because it's always difficult. It's always people are referring to secret reports somewhere. I mean, how do you want to check? But we know that the Taliban are getting their money mostly from local taxes. Let's call that taxes from the population. And from gift uh, coming from uh, the Arab Gulf or coming from Pakistan. That's the main resources. Plus drugs and something that is not even not, not enough said, we are financing the Taliban. Because actually we are giving a lot of money for development project, for aid, and a part of this money is of course going directly to the Taliban. For example, when uh, we are arming the Afghan National Army, we are giving arms, a part of these, these arms are, are, are re, uh, regularly sold to the Taliban. So, basically, the, the second argument doesn't work. So, how do you explain that uh, Marja is becoming this very important place, that it's a turning point of the war? Why? Because, actually, uh, in 2006, that's the beginning of the story, the British tried to clear Helmand from the Taliban. Uh, the Taliban were very strong. They were in control of most of the, of the Helmand province. So you see all this, uh, this uh, area here. Yes, from uh, Lashkarga to Musakala, if it's on the map. And uh, they made a major mistake. They tried to control all the province. And of course, it's impossible. There were a few thousand men. And how do you, want, how do you control a, a place like Helmand with a few thousand men? It's just not possible. So the Afghan used to say that the foreigners are controlling what they are seeing. So, you know, if they see, uh, even with, with a good uh, uh, spectacle, whatever, I mean, you, you, don't, you don't see very far, you know. So what happened is that progressively after 2006, Elman became a symbolic place. And we send regular every year the offensive lot larger. That's, that's explaining why actually you had more than 400 casualties in Elman since 2001. So it's a little less than 25% of the overall casualties of the, of the coalition. In a province that has no strategic importance. You know, if you, loo if you lose 400 men for Kandahar or for Kabul, you can agree or not agree, but it makes sense, you know. In the case of Elman, it just doesn't make sense. And the last operation this year in Marja is in the same logic. We want to win in Marja because we, we have lost before. Not because it's important in itself, just because we have lost before. It's just to make a point, if you want. And uh, that's exactly what we are doing. We are, we are so-called winning under the Taliban. The problem of this is mostly that we are obliged to stay. If we leave, the Taliban are back in uh, two weeks, uh, one week. And so every, every, everything is lost. So we cannot leave the place because the Afghan National Army is not ready to take control of it. One of the most interesting things is that during the fight in Marja a few weeks ago, actually the Afghan National Army did not fight. They were firing uh, the sky just to be sure that they were not killing Taliban. And it's extremely interesting, extremely important because it was uh, very often said that it was uh, offensive Marines and uh, Afghan National Army fighting together side by side and so on. It's not the case, actually. The Marines fought and the Afghan National Army came after and basically didn't want to fight. So uh, we are now with thousands of what is the US best troop, Marines, uh, stuck in a place without any strategic importance, unable to withdraw, for political reason, and it's exactly the people that will be needed somewhere else in Afghanistan, okay? So we can describe Marja as a kind of tactical success and strategic disaster, if it would be fair to, to, to describe it like that. What is important for us is the way it was described by the media, and uh, it was described in the media in a very uh, favorable light, you know. And then, I mean, I'm not going to address this question tonight, but 
it asks some question about how the journalists are working, for God's sakes, in Afghanistan. The second point, more larger interpretation of the counterinsurgency strategy. You remember that McChrystal uh, leaked this report about counterinsurgency in the press. It was in late August. And there was all this debate about what is counterinsurgency, what are we doing to do in Afghanistan. Let me just remind you the, the key point of this strategy. Uh, first, uh, you clear the place, you clear a place where there is a large amount of population, clear the place from the Taliban, you stay there, and you build a reasonably good administration, Afghan administration, and then you go to another district, another place, and so on and so on. And then slowly you marginalize the, the insurgency. The problem is that even if you do that in places where you have actually a real, uh, real strategic importance, where you should fight, maybe, even if you're doing that, this strategy is totally under-resourced. You cannot do that with uh, the coalition will be about one, 150,000 men uh, at the end of this year. You have 100,000 uh, contractors. So altogether, it's something like 250,000 men working <laughs> for the coalition. With that kind of uh, with that kind of uh, of uh, of, uh, uh, of troops, you cannot do counterinsurgency uh, seriously. If you want just to do counterinsurgency in, uh, uh, for example, in Kandahar, I guess it's Kandahar. Uh, the city is probably over uh, 500,000 inhabitants. It's mostly Taliban. It's totally Talibanized, actually. Uh, right now, in the city of Kandahar, during the night, you have groups of five to ten Taliban fighters going where they want in the city, attacking police posts, killing people. So the, the city is basically in the end of the Taliban. And of course, the judges, the real judges, are Taliban judges inside the city of Kandahar. So, to think that even with 10,000 or 20,000 US troops, you can control, what does it mean, control the city of Kandahar, seems to me over-optimistic. And then if you're doing that in 5, 10, 20 districts, uh, you're, not, you're not going to have enough troops. And the idea that the Afghan National Army is going to, to, to help you to take control, to take, take charge of this district after the, 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 the fight is not going to work. For example, in the city of Kandahar, there's going to be a large offensive in a few weeks. What's going to happen? The US forces are going to fight for the preservation of what is actually the most corrupt uh, local government in Afghanistan. We are fighting to protect drug dealers, uh, strong men, in the very dirty sense of the term, people who are basically uh, monopolizing all the contracts with the coalition, making a lot of money. It's, uh, uh, they are basically criminals. And we are fighting to secure these people. So the idea that from that the population is going to be very nice with us because we have, we have secured the city against, it's not going to work. We are actually, and that's one of the key problem with the counterinsurgency strategy, we are actually the main provider of insecurity in Afghanistan. People in Marja were quite happy without us. They were free to cultivate opium, and they need some money, as everybody. The local system, the local Taliban were absolutely not great, but they were not interfering much with the life of the people. And so the trouble began when we came, because now it's going to be uh, mines, IEDs, uh, it's going to be ambushes, it's going to be a, a kind of secret war to eliminate uh, uh, spies, both, uh, both sides of, uh, of the war, uh, the coalition and the Taliban, it's going to be dirty. And people know that. So the idea that give, uh, Pulling more, uh, putting more troops in, in Kandahar is going to, 
to help us to be popular with the Afghans, I think it's probably not going to work. Yeah. On a larger, uh, larger, larger strategical uh, plan now, you, you have seen, you have understood from the news that Kandahar, Helmand, and probably a few, a few provinces around are going to, to be the priority of the coalition. What does it mean? It means that places where the Taliban had made a lot of progress should be Kunduz around here, here notably, and in the south, Barlan, all these places, here in Erat, where the Taliban now are, are becoming quite strong, all these places, Badris, all the north, and a lot of places in the, in the east here, where the Taliban are totally free to do what they want, these places actually will uh, be totally outside of the search. 80% of Afghanistan will not see a difference between uh, 89 and two, uh, 89, uh, 2009 and 2010, except maybe that the Taliban will be stronger. In other words, we are putting too uh, much of our resources in the south. It's very clear. Uh, we forget about the north, we forget about the west, and we are going to pay for it. So what's the logical consequence of that? First, it's, it seems to me extremely difficult to, uh, to, to break the momentum of the Taliban with this kind of strategy. Even if the fight is terrible in two provinces, the Taliban are a national movement. They will fight somewhere else. And we cannot do the counterinsurgency strategy everywhere because we don't have enough troops. So, very clearly, uh, if you push the, the Taliban outside of, of Helmand, uh, they will go to Kandahar. Or they will go to the north of Helmand because actually the current offensive in Helmand is just in one third of the, of the province. So they can just move 50 kilometers or 60 kilometers. They, they are safe. And if we try to do that again and again, after two or three provinces, we don't have enough troops. So it's going to be a kind of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of dead end. You know? uh, we don't have, uh, we don't have the, the, very simply, we don't have the time, we don't have the men to do what was described as the counterinsurgency program. What's going to be a problem also is the casualties. This kind of strategy is very, very, uh, uh, um, uh, is producing a lot of casualties. Probably this year we will be around 700, 800, compared to f a little more than 500 last year. If we, uh, if we just uh, look at the first two months of this year, there is a 100% increase of the casualties. I'm not sure it's going to stay like that, but it's likely that we are going to be near the, 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 the war in Iraq in terms of casualties. It's a lot. It means we don't have a lot of time to do that because the public opinion is going to say stop at some point. In Europe, they already say stop. So now, that was the first, the first point. The second point is about the idea that we can actually uh, try to split the Taliban we can to reintegrate some Taliban, some so-called moderate Taliban. We can to do something. Uh, we can to have some kind of indirect strategy. And that's why probably the conference was, was in London because it's a kind of uh, cultural, uh, uh, I mean, it's a very old thing in the, 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 the cultural st strategic uh, of, uh, of the, the, the British. So is that going to work? Is it possible to pay the Taliban, and just they, they, they will stop uh, the fight. I don't think so. Uh, first thing, it never worked. It has been tried before. It's not some, some kind of new idea, you know. Uh, just uh, a few years ago, in 2005, six, it has been tried extensively in Helmand. It has been tried in the East. So we have some kind of idea of what's going to happen. First, what's going to happen is that uh, people will surrender, in a way, just to make money. So you're going to see hundreds or thousands of people 
we will say, okay, we are not going to fight anymore. The problem is that most of the time, these people are not real Taliban. They just make a deal with the local authority so they can get money. And remember what happened when there was this so-called disarmament process in Afghanistan. It was probably, it was, uh, it was more or less managed by some uh, Japanese, and uh, nothing against the Japanese, but in this case, it was a real, a real catastrophe. And we are going to see the same thing. Yeah. People see, obviously, that you can make money with that. Or they will be real Taliban, they will get the money, and they will come, come back to the fight. So we have no guarantee. This kind of program is basically a kind of bet, and I would say a little stupid bet. The second thing is that, are we speaking about individuals or about groups? And we are two different things here. If we are speaking about individuals, it doesn't matter. You can have 200 or 300 Taliban fighters rallying the government somewhere, and the Taliban organization is, a, is, is, is perfectly able to recruit new members. Because actually, you have a lot of people in Afghanistan who are favorable to the Taliban, who are, let's say, between 15 and 25, uh, we, who, for different reasons, do not like the, the coalition, or do not like Karzai, or both. Uh, and these people are ready to fight. And you don't need a lot of people. The, the population of Afghanistan is around uh, uh, over 30 million. You need basically uh, 25 to 30,000 people. You know, it's a very small percentage. So the idea that buying individually the Taliban is going to work doesn't make sense. Now, if you try to work at the level of groups, you know, okay, I'm not going to buy one Taliban. I'm going to... to to make a better deal, I'm going to buy 100 Taliban at the same time with the commander. So what's going to happen? Uh, two things are possible. Or the commander is going to be killed, and basically we are back to the first case. Or second, the commander is going to survive. It would be a little miraculous, but I mean, it could happen. And he's going to, to he will become a, a local uh, bandit, actually. He will contribute a lot to the local disorder. Because he's, not go he's going to keep his arms. Actually, I mean, if you have been a Taliban fighter, you're working with the government. If you don't keep your gun, you're dead. Or you're living in Kabul. If you're living in Kabul, you're, not, I mean, you're out, outside the, the, the political system. It doesn't, doesn't matter. And if they keep their gun, what do you think this kind of group can do locally? Well, we know. We know because it's been the case before. We know because it's exactly what happened in Helmand in 2006. Some guys were, were, were bought by the, by the British. And they, most of them were killed. A few uh, went to Kabul. And the rest become some kind of gang, criminal gangs in Helmand, dealing drugs. So the idea that we are going to buy more Taliban, first is going to be costly. And second, it's not going to work. And here we have a larger problem. Seriously, what we have seen on the ground since one year, since last year, it's not a counterinsurgency. It's something different. It's first targeting assassination a lot with results that are, it's working short term. It's working for three, six months. You're killing the local uh, Taliban commander. It's working, but at the same time, the population is not very happy because uh, well, well, you're wrong sometimes, you're killing kids, or well, so it's a political problem. And the second thing is uh, we are giving a lot of money to militia, local militia, local groups. People who were fighting in the 80s, for example. Okay, this guy was a commander in the 80s. You know, it's, the, the, it's uh, 20 years after, you know, the, the musketeers, you know, it's 20 years after. So, okay, uh, the guy is getting money, so he's going to call his old buddies and form a new militia locally. We have seen that a lot uh, in these places, in Barlan. So uh, probably uh, Kunduz is here. <laughs> and, uh, well, good. And uh, here should be uh, Barlan, so it should be around here. We have seen that. What's the result? Same result. Disorder. Real disorder. Because these people, they have friends, and, but they have a lot of enemies. And at the end, 
what we are seeing in a lot of places, people are fighting each other. They are not even fighting the Taliban. They are fighting each other locally to settle old scores, you know. And I'm sp not speaking here about some kind of marginal special ops. The money is here. 1.3 billion uh, emergency money given to the U.S. commander on the ground. So 1.3 billion to basically to, to pay for everything they think it's, it's, it's good. Mostly it's going to be about militia. And we are speaking about probably a little more than one third of the country. To put this amount of money in the system, you're breaking everything. Of course, there is no structure, no infrastructure, nothing. You cannot, I mean, people cannot just spend the money. In plenty of places, people cannot spend the money. Uh, because it's not possible. And a large part of this money is going to the Taliban and so on and so on. I think you have understood the, the logic. There is a, a, a slightly a variation of this, uh, of this policy, that is the tribal, tribal policy. You know, Afghanistan, you have plenty of tribes, people have turbans, they are bearded, like me, but better. I mean, so, and it worked, it worked in Iraq, of course. So what are we going to do? We're going to find the good tribes and not the lost one, the good one, and we are going to pay. We are going to pay a lot of money. Same problem. We've tried already. We've tried in a place that is gar uh, called Gardez and Rost. Here it's really, I'm guessing. Um, should be around here, Gardez and Rost. So it's going to be, uh, it, it, was, it was done in Gardez and Rost. Gardez was the first PRT, you know, Provincial Reconstruction Team. The places where it was some special ops, but short-term project just to be popular with the population. Hundreds of millions. It's not small money. It's hundreds of millions since 2002. Result, you cannot go to the bazaar. I mean, in, in Gardez, you just cannot go physically to the bazaar. It's too dangerous. It's a problem. And it's not a huge bazaar. It's one street, actually. <laughs> it's a two street, okay. It's two street. And uh, you cannot go there because it's dangerous and it's totally under the control of the Taliban. So, and this place is the most tribalized place in Afghanistan. And when we are speaking about tribes, we should be careful about not confusing two things. Maybe I would say 40%, 30-40% of the Afghans have a tribal identity. If you ask the question, they can say, okay, I'm a Barakzai, okay, I'm a Shirzai, I'm a, um, a Popolzai, okay. They can answer the question. But you have very few Afghans, actually, that are part of tribal institutions. And tribal institution is, is, is not just to have a chief, you know, it's to have a, a tribal council and uh, to have rules and to have some kind of solidarity. And that is only in a few provinces in the East. Yeah. So... If there was one place in Afghanistan where it was possible to try the, the, the tribal policy, it was there. It never worked. Now all the tribes are working with the, the Taliban, or almost, except one or two. We have a major problem here. And what we want to do now is to find more tribes. So, and uh, just a parenthesis, you know, there was a very bad uh, little book uh, called uh, One Tribe at a Time. It was written, it was kind of a crazy book written by a guy who was working with special ops in the, at the beginning of the war. Uh, and it was some kind of uh, required reading for the special ops. And when you see the amount of, of cliché, you know, of bad orientalism, you're, you're, you're just afraid, you know. Uh, and uh, it starts, I mean, just the start is beautiful because they call the local, uh, the local Pashtun uh, leader who is not, the, I think, technically a, a tribal chief, but they, whatever, they call him Sitting Bull, you know. So you see, the, the, you see where it goes, you know. And, uh, well, it's nice. I mean, it's kind of bad, the liberal Western movies of the 60s, you know, where the Indians are close to the nature. And, well, I mean, <laughs> whatever. Uh, it's bad, and it's going to have some uh, very serious uh, uh, effect. The worst is that it's irreversible. 
when you give people autonomy, when you give people gun, it's over. Uh, you, I mean, it's like the proverbial toothpaste. Um, the third point is about um, the Pakistan, Pakistani policy. Here, I'm not going to... Actually, I don't know much about Pakistan. I mean, that's should have said that before. Uh, I'm working more on Afghanistan. And uh, Pakistan is kind of black box for me, so I'm more calling colleagues working on, I'm following Pakistan, but I'm not very sure. What's clear is that first, uh, the Pakistani military, as and civilians are out of the picture, of course, huh? the Pakistani military has the same idea about uh, what are the strategic threat against Pakistan? First, India. Second, India. Third, India. So they are totally, totally fascinated by India. It's a very strange relationship. It's not totally rational in a way, but it's kind of it's there. You know, it's about Kashmir. It's about India, and so all the the Pakistan military is doing in Afghanistan must be is part, actually, of a larger policy against India. And here, nothing has changed recently. And of course, uh, I'm not giving you a secret, but the conditionality of the uh, American aid to Pakistan is zero, actually. The United States doesn't control the way uh, the Pakistan military is spending its money. It's, it's, it's out of control. So the idea that there was some kind of pressure from uh, from the United States against Pakistan, and then Pakistan f felt obliged to do something about the Taliban doesn't work. Doesn't I mean there is no empirical data. Yeah, I, I don't trust that. Nobody nobody thinks that actually. At the same time, you have really something that happened. Barodar was arrested, and after Barodar, four or five important, pretty important guys in the Taliban were arrested. So we have to reconcile the two facts actually. And there is one interpretation that for the moment is working. So I'm going to give you this interpretation and then I'm going to give you, very honestly, uh, the test, how to test this interpretation in the next few months. So first, the interpretation. Uh, the possible interpretation is that uh, the Pakistani military thinks that we are in a kind of end game in Afghanistan. So basically the war is over, the Taliban have won the war. It's not only the Pakistani military who thinks that, it's everybody. The Europeans, mostly, they don't say it clearly, but if, uh, if you're French, good ears, you, you can understand. Uh, Iran, all the Central Asian states, uh, India, India is saying it very clearly, uh, and of course the Pakistani military. They should know because they are helping the Taliban, so they have good information. And What's happening, maybe, is that now the key is to control the Taliban leadership if there is some negotiation with Afghanistan and with the coalition. Why? Because, of course, the Pakistan military knows where is Mullah Omar, the leader of the Taliban. Of course they know. They, they knew where was uh, Mullah Baradar. They, they know the address, of course. Uh, at the same time, they need to control these people. And Mullah Baradar, it's interesting, was an old Taliban, kind of national, nationalist guy, Afghanistan first. He didn't like the ISIS, he didn't like the Pakistanis, but most of the Taliban do not like, just do not like the Pakistanis, at least the, the Pakistani military and the, the Pakistani state, I would say. And what's possible is that all these arrests are just a way to discipline the Taliban, to say, okay, who's in charge now? It's us. Why? Because it seems that Barodar and a few other Taliban wanted direct talks with Karzai and the Americans. And it was not acceptable from a Pakistani point of view. So a way to, 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 to make things very clear to the Taliban was to arrest a few of them. And then you can explain why Mullah Barodar was not given to the Americans. He's somewhere in Pakistan, but he's certainly not under the control of, uh, uh, of the CIA. The CIA, CIA doesn't really have access to him, it seems. And uh, the idea that he could be sent to Afghanistan is, is 
it's not on the table. So you have a few uh, a few elements like that that I think are a good uh, good uh, uh, give us a good idea of what's going on. What are the tests? Are we going to see something on the ground like a large offensive on northern Waziristan? It's not the case right now, and it seems that the Pakistan military has been very clear with the, the, the U.S. Army. It's not going to be a large offensive on the border. So, concretely, nothing, nothing has changed for the foot soldier, for the Taliban foot soldier. It's still, the border is still totally open. The, the second point that could be interesting, uh, interesting is, are we going to see the arrest of Mullah Omar? If you arrest Mullah Omar, you kind of create a large uh, leadership problem inside the Taliban. If you arrest, let's say, uh, all the Quetta Shura, the, the, the leadership of the Taliban. So then, we, here, really, something is happening. Yeah. And remember what happened uh, to the PKK after the arrest of Abdullah Jalan? Uh, I don't say it's the same thing, but could have an impact. Third, if uh, Hakani who is the leader of, uh, of the Taliban in the East, is killed. Hakani has always worked very closely to the, to the SISI, to the Pakistani military, and it's very likely that, uh, you remember maybe last week there was a, a huge bomb, bombing in, in uh, it's a suicide attack plus bombing in uh, Kabul, and eight or nine Indians were killed. The same day, uh, it was the opening of the negotiation on, Cap on Kashmir between uh, India and, uh, and Pakistan. It seems to me very clear that first it was Hakani who organized the, the, the thing, because it's always him who is organizing, organizing this kind of strike inside Kabul. Second, very clear that it was organized or, and uh, directly decided by the ASI. It's not an Afghan initiative. To kill nine uh, Indians in Kabul is Nothing, I mean, the Taliban basically uh, do not care about India. So that's why I st think still that uh, we are here not in a new uh, policy, really, but just a new phase of the old policy. So what's the conclusion? I don't see clearly my watch. Is uh, I'm all right for the timing? Or? Ten minutes more. Okay, perfect. Um, so what's the conclusion of this this first part of the of the this first and very long part of the of the presentation is that we don't have a lot of things uh, to 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 hope for next year. Uh, 2011 should be worse than 2010. Uh, and it's a key element because after 2011 no reinforcement the Dutch the Canadians are out of Afghanistan, 5,000 men. The Italians are not very enthusiastic. The Germans are not very enthusiastic, and the Spanish, and so on and so on. So except the British, uh, the French will feel obliged, at least for a few years, to stay there. But you're seeing slowly the coalition, you know, breaking down. We have a major problem with NATO. The war in Afghanistan is destroying NATO deeply. The credibility of NATO the relationship between NATO members to see the Dutch going out of, I mean, out of Afghanistan is something. The Dutch were supposed to be uh, uh, very much inside the NATO system. So, you know, when you see that Gates wants a renegotiation of the NATO, uh, NATO agreement, basically, and the idea that, yes, it's an, uh, it's an agreement about defensing uh, 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 helping ourselves, you know, uh, it's Article Five of uh, of, uh, of NATO uh, agreement. Uh, but he wants also NATO to be uh, uh, expeditionary force. NATO forces to be sent in Africa. Well, are the Europeans going to accept that? Knowing what's going on in Afghanistan, I, I'm not sure. So it's a lot of tensions building up between uh, Europe and uh, the the United States. So. What are now the, 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 the possible exits? Yeah. First, I think that uh, we are basically in a situation where negotiation with the Taliban leadership are the most likely hypothesis. 
We don't have another exit. Uh, Karzai government is not going to work better next year. Why? Because Karzai has lost all legitimacy with the last election in August, in August 2009. To give you just an idea, there was huge, massive fraud. That's the point. People did not go to vote, not because of security, because, but as a way of protest against uh, Karzai. He has been probably so-called elected, in a way, with 10 to 15 percent of the votes, of the people who are able to vote in Afghanistan, because only the turnout was 30 percent, and he got less than 50 percent of 30 percent. And I think the real turnout was probably more 20. So he's been elected with, what, 10, 15 at the best. He has no legitimacy. He is uh, politically in a very difficult situation in Afghanistan. His lack of legitimacy makes him more and more dependent on strong men, criminal gangs, local powers. So he's in no position to reform the state. Because how do you want to reform the state? In Kandahar, for example, where it's very needed, you know, his brother is in charge. What? I mean, what do you want to do against that? In the north, he made an agreement with Rashid Dostum, a, a war criminal. Well, he's not going to, to, to discipline Dostum or to, to, to do anything in the north because it just he doesn't have the legitimacy. He doesn't have the money. He doesn't have the resources to do it. So the idea that Karza is going to change, it's it's probably not true. It's not going to be better. So that's why we are probably obliged to negotiate the exit in Afghanistan. Because next year, we'll have Karzai a little weaker. We'll have more casualties, and it's a kind of dead end. So how to negotiate? Well, what's, is it possible to negotiate? I'm not sure it's possible, actually. I'm saying it's, it's the, the best option we have, but I'm not totally sure it's possible. But I see a lot of possibilities. First, uh, you can have a ceasefire. A ceasefire is the thing we need in Afghanistan because we have always been in this logic that we put more resources and the output will be better. It never worked. Since 2002, there is a surge every year in Afghanistan. We started with 20, 25,000 men for the coalition. We are now at uh, 150,000 plus the contractors. So there has been a surge every year. You know, the idea that the surge is a new thing, absolutely not, you know. And there is not a lot of differences between what, what was happening in 2007 or 8 and what is happening now. You know, a lot of uh, the ideas that the population to, to be nice with the people and so on, it's been written before. It has been done to a certain extent. So a ceasefire is interesting because it's a way of saying, okay, Let's take a deep breath. Uh, let's talk. Uh, it could be six months. Uh, let's try to, to, to organize the process to, to, to maybe make a deal with local, uh, local people. You know? And the idea is that when people have been demobilized militarily for six months, it's a little difficult to go back to the thing. You know? When you stop running, you, it's difficult to, to, to run again. You know? Basically, you, you go home. Huh? When you stop running, you say, okay, half an hour, it's enough. Uh, okay, I'm going up. Again, yeah, the insurgency is not very different. You know, People are dying every day. The, the, the war is very hard. So if during six months, people are able to go to the cities to, to, uh, to be more relaxed, probably to, to make some local deals, uh, I think there is a, a real probability that people will feel more favorable to a political deal. The second, so in itself, I mean, the process is interesting. The process is a good thing. The second point is that the political game must be extremely simple. Uh, if we are trying to put the, uh, the, the Iranians and so the, the, the Saudis in the same room, plus the Indians and the Pakistanis, of course it's not going to work. Because zero-sum game, I mean, it's very clear. So that... That is, should be out of the table. But if you have negotiation with the Taliban, uh, the US, uh, I mean the coalition, but in fact the United States, plus uh, the Taliban and Karzai, it's 
possible that a deal will emerge. Uh, and what are the, the two conditions of the deal, basically? First, uh, the Taliban want some kind of symbolic uh, victory in the sense that uh, it must be a Sharia-based uh, Sharia uh, political system, that uh, they want, uh, you know, Islam everywhere, return. Uh, bon, okay. We know more or less that these symbolic issues uh, are a pain because it means some very very uh, with very serious threats against uh, women rights against minority rights especially the ismailis who are not considered muslim uh, by the by the taliban uh, we know that there are groups at risk that's very clear uh, we know also that uh, there is a major risk that the taliban are not going to keep their word and trying to get the control of all the country we know all that uh, but at the same time uh, is it po it is probably possible that the Taliban will be able to make a deal because they don't want to be under the control of the Pakistanis. And I think that the arrest of Baradar, for example, we are speaking about that just, uh, just earlier, is a sign also that there is no trust between the Taliban and the Pakistanis. So if the Taliban can go back to Afghanistan and say goodbye to the Pakistanis, they will do it. They will do it. Yeah. The problem is that what do you do with Mullah Omar? It's not very clear. The guy is a kind of charismatic leader. He came back from the defeat in 2001, and that's very prestigious in a way. He's a guy who said no to the, to the Americans, and he survived. He's kind of uh, the equivalent of Massoud, you know. Massoud was in the north, okay, but the way Massoud resisted to the, to the Soviet, the way Mullah Omar is resisting to the United States, it is a real parallel for different kinds of people in Afghanistan. But there is a real parallel. So Moloma is going to be a problem, especially because Karzai is seen as corrupted, weak, uh, a puppet of the United States, you know, the old. And uh, I'm not sure it's, it's going to work. But probably it's worth it. The second level is, why is the coalition fighting in Afghanistan? And there you have a clear answer. You know, it's not about democracy. Um, it's about one clear thing. Uh, Western governments, but mostly United States, are afraid that maybe Al-Qaeda could come back to Afghanistan if the Taliban are part of a political process. That's the only strategic reason, real reason, in terms of, uh, of uh, rational, I mean, governmental policy. I don't speak about ethics, I don't speak about things like that. So, is it possible to have some kind of guarantee? Is it possible to deal with the Pakistanis, the Pakistani military? Are there common interests? To a certain extent, I think yes, because the Pakistani military has been targeted by Al-Qaeda. Don't forget that a lot of bombings in Pakistan are directly uh, are organized by Al-Qaeda against the Pakistani military. So the idea that there is a common interest in between Pakistan and Western countries to fight Al-Qaeda, I think is right. And so far, all the people who have been killed or arrested in Pakistan have been killed or arrested because the SI was doing his job. Well, I mean, we can discuss about the way they are doing their job, but I mean, there was, it was a relatively sincere effort, I think. Yeah. So probably there is a way to compromise, a way to, to do things with the Pakistanis on these specific issues. And then, of course, you have the possibility of uh, of having a, a specific agreement with the Afghan government about striking Al-Qaeda members in Afghanistan and so on and so on. So there are technical possibilities. I would like to, to say a uh, word of, of conclusion now. Um, what is seen as a turning point in the, in the media? You know, ah, the, the, the coalition has the momentum. Uh, it was the best week uh, for the coalition since 2000. All these titles, you know, I mean, I, I think are, are probably wrong because my feeling is that we are in an end game. The current offensive in uh, Kandahar, the offensive that a few weeks ago in Marja, all that is just a way to prepare the negotiation. Of course, uh, it's an ethical problem because people are dying in Marja for basically not much. And we should, as, as human beings, ask a few questions about that. Uh, basically, Marja is Washington politics. 
it's not about a strategy in Afghanistan. It's not serious. But at the same time, it's clear that for the U.S. military, there is no way out. You cannot fight your way out of Afghanistan. You have to make a deal with people at some point. And my feeling is that they know it now. And what they want to do in Kandahar is not a kind of counterinsurgency where you, 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 you clear the Taliban out of Kandahar. I, I, nobody knows how to do that. I mean, how do you... I mean, well, anyway, uh, it's not that. It's much more about making a point in Kandahar, in Helmand, and at the same time starting the negotiation with, with the Taliban. The problem, of course, is uh, if the negotiations are not working, uh, we have a huge, massive problem. And second problem, if the negotiation with the Taliban leadership are working, but not with the Taliban in Afghanistan at the local level, we have a worse problem because we do not know how to deal with a war that would be totally decentralized. Remember what happened to the, uh, to the Soviet in the 80s. So uh, for all this reason, I think that it's time for a negotiation. And uh, even if the result is not very clear, uh, it should start uh, now. Thank you very much. Uh, the first question is about uh, the sources, what kind of sources I'm using. Uh, that's, that's a tricky question. Uh, why? Because you have a lot of information. I start working uh, on the war in the, the, the end of the 80s, you know, 88. And at that time, you know, the, the game was simple. You, you just took your, your notebook and you, you were traveling. It was fun. You have horses. You, you know, it was... Uh, it was nice, and you had the information directly, okay? Uh, plus, you have books, but basically, most of the information was on the ground. We are now in a very different situation. First, uh, you have hundreds of PhD about Afghanistan. You have a secondary literature that is huge, you know, that you can use to a certain extent. You have newspaper, both Afghan uh, uh, or international uh, uh, newspaper or American or, you know, you have a lot of sources. You have the internal report of the, the international organization, of uh, NGOs. I can use all that. So the, the information is, is, is all there. But the key for me uh, is uh, just from time to time call a guy in Kabul and say, okay, what do you think is going in Helmand? Say, okay, I don't know, but we can ask a friend. And this kind of very low-key thing. Uh, to give you an example, uh, I tried to go to Helmand. Uh, it was last summer, but I, I could not go to Helmand. So I went to Kandahar. And Kandahar, it's impossible to work, basically. You cannot walk alone in the bazaar. So first I thought that it was the, uh, the guys who I was where, and I said, okay, come on, I mean, I know the country, and you're not going to put me in a car like uh, if I were an American, sorry. Uh, and no, they refused, because it's too dangerous, you know. So it's kind of interview, you can have interviews in Canada, you can take your car and, and go to see people, but it's not exactly the kind of work I used to do in the 90s. You cannot go to the villages. It's impossible, just impossible, it's too dangerous for you and for the people you are with. So what we, we what I have done, I was a little lucky, and there was guys coming from uh, uh, from Elmont. So I asked the guy, OK, what's the situation in Elmont? And these guys were extremely well connected. And I knew about Elmont because I worked on Elmont before. And then the key is not the information. The key is how do you interpret the information, you know? And I think more and more that's make that what makes the difference. When I, I went to, to Kunduz, for example, in the north of Afghanistan uh, last year, it was very clear to me that Kunduz was out of control. But it was not officially said. People first were not sure locally because they, they, had not, they, they were not good at interpreting the information for different reasons. And second, Nobody wanted to say it officially because it was a problem. The South was supposed to be the problem, not the North. So the idea that Kunduz was out of control, you know, I was alone to say that in April 2009. Uh, 
uh, in summer 2009, it was obvious, just because the road was from uh, Kunduz to Kabul was just cut uh, a few hours a day. So, I mean, it's a kind of obvious problem. So, here again, it was the interpretation of information. It was not the information, the question. It was all there. It was all the newspaper. It was uh, just calling people from the place. It was all absolutely available. Why is the, the, the intelligence on Afghanistan so bad? Because people are working in very specific places. They don't have a general interpretation of the situation. They have this strange idea that the Taliban are a local movement. They are a national movement. And so the way they interpret the data is always wrong. But they are very good data. And I don't, well, of course, I don't have access to secret information. But honestly, what's the difference? They are always late. So, I mean, it doesn't make a difference, honestly. So again and again, the interpretation of the situation depends on the paradigm. What kind of paradigm do you use? No. When you're starting your conversation saying that Afghanistan is a post-conflict, uh, blah, 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 you've already lost the war. You know, because it's not post-conflict. The conflict is building up every year. But all the time, you are still people saying a little less now, but people are explaining, well, we are in a post-conflict situation. What the hell? I mean, uh, it's not just possible. You know, it's all the time like that. And people are speaking about tribe, when they don't understand what is a tribe, and people, you know, that's where you make the difference. Yeah. Recently, uh, about drones, and there was two conclusions of the report. It was with open sources. Huh? Uh, first conclusion, uh, civilian casualties were one-third. So, when you're killing two Taliban, or one Taliban, you're ki you, oh, no, it's, when you're killing, because it's going to be difficult. <laughs> but you get the idea, I'm huh? not very good with figures. Uh, when you're telling, killing uh, nine Taliban, you're, you're, you're in fact killing uh, three civilians inside. That's the one conclusion that was interesting, and it was about the strikes in Pakistan. Huh? We agree. The second point is why well, it was not very useful, and I was surprised by the conclusion, because I had this feeling that it was working in a way. And uh, the conclusion was, no, no, it's not working. It's not breaking the organization. But uh, people are much more careful, of course. Uh, they tend to be more careful with their cell phone. They sleep outside their house, and so on and so on. So that was this report. But there are something else that we know, is that it's extremely unpopular in Afghanistan, in uh, Pakistan. So we know that clearly. It's extremely, extremely unpopular. So that's one, one, uh, one aspect of the question. But the second aspect is that drones are, are no use in Afghanistan. So you have this idea that, and you have this beautiful thing that probably you don't know because it's not often in the media. You have this white big balloon uh, above uh, Kabul and above uh, Kandahar. First thing you, you see when you're arriving in Kandahar is a big white balloon with plenty of cameras, you know, and so 24 hours a day, uh, you have this, uh, this, this camera. So the first, the first reaction of the Afghan is that they are looking at our woman. <laughs> it was a huge, uh, huge protest because, of course, uh, you, you can see directly in the houses. You can see the, ter the terrace. You can see, I mean, it's a, it's a real social problem. And people have some kind of very strange idea about what the U.S. military is doing with these pictures. I mean, I, anyway, uh, it's a real social problem. You know? And the second thing is that more and more you have this idea that it's probably possible to, to stop to a certain extent uh, IEDs uh, because you, you watch people, you follow people, you, you do that in real time. So now you have uh, every day hundreds of, uh, of hours of film coming from Afghanistan that are actually... Uh, treated, if you say that, uh, in, uh, it, in Tampa, I think, I mean, in the United States. So it's a huge process. Probably locally it can work, but uh, I would say that the general dynamic of the war is not going to be changed by that. There is no, from my point of view, a technical solution to the Afghan war. There is actually two ways to answer. Uh, yes, the question is, uh, is, there, is, is there a way to clientize the tribe uh, could that work? Is, well, create, create a, yeah, something like that. Um, so there are 
two, two answers to your question. The first answer is a very general observation with very concrete consequences. And the second is more, more punctual. The, the, the first answer is that uh, historically, the tribes are down, the mullahs are up, <laughs> and the political parties are up. So you're fighting with the wrong guys, you know. Uh, the tribes are losing ground every day, everywhere, in Pakistan and in Afghanistan. So you're betting on a dying structure. That's, uh, that's a real problem. Of course, you can say, okay, it's maybe dying, but you inject some money, you give them arms, and maybe they are going to flourish again. Why not? After all, uh, 92, 93, it's a phase of retribalization in these places. Same thing happened in 2001, 2002. If you, you look at uh, what the anthropologist Bernd Glasner was saying about this part, perfect. He's saying, okay, we see more uh, tribal, uh, uh, tribal uh, institution working in these places. At the same time, uh, now it's not working. They are dying as a structure. And now I'm going to give you a second, uh, a second answer that is more, more precise. Is that you should not, you should understand what the Taliban were doing at the same time. And you know Hakani is from the Zadran tribe, but he's not a tribal chief. Hakani is not a tribal chief, we agree. But, but he was able to just to, to control the Zadran. And they have always, since the, 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 the end of the, I mean, the beginning of the 80s now, the game is always the same. The mullahs are destroying the tribal system. Oh, first, you have inside the tribes a lot of young men who think that they can make a name for themselves in the Taliban. So they don't see the, the use to, to talk with the old men with white beard. I mean, well... I mean, they, they are young, they want to fight, they want to kill Americans, they want to, to be somebody, you know. And in this area of the world, uh, the Taliban are a good bet. They have social prestige, uh, they are doing a jihad. If they are killed, they are, don't need to wash them. They are going directly to paradise. Their body is going to, to, to smell perfume. And it's very, very solid reason. And... That's the first point. Second point is that the Taliban are playing the tribal game the way you and me will never do. For example, uh, they are building trans-tribal groups. It should not exist. I mean, it's not in the books, you know. Uh, how do you understand that? They are building, they are taking fighters from five different tribes, enemies tribe and not just tribes, just people who are fighting each other normally when they are good Afghan, uh, you know. But no, no, they are fighting in the same groups. And this is destroying the system. Third point, the Taliban are killing the leaders who, who do not collaborate with them. It's very clear. For example, you, you have a tribe on the border, let's say, and this tribe is normally linked to Karzai, but they have been uh, totally surrounded. If they want to go out of their place, for the civilian normal people, they need a bus. But unfortunately, the road is, is totally mined. What are you doing? They cannot sell their potatoes, because in this case, potatoes, to, the, to, the, to Parachinar, which is on the Pakistani border, but the other side. They cannot go there to sell their potatoes. They, they, they are losing money. After a while, this tribe decided that maybe, after all, we can make a deal with the Taliban. And the Taliban, what do they ask? They ask just to, to, to go through, to take a young men if they are volunteer, but just to go through the place. That's it. And I don't see how you can change the momentum. It's too strong now. It could have worked maybe in 2002, 2003, but a lot of mistakes were made. I mean, if you have worked on, you know, a lot of mistakes. Special ops, for example have been a disaster, you know. How do you explain to, to but it was, a, on, the, on the paper, it was a success, you know. They killed a guy, so what? So they killed two guys, three guys, and at the fourth guy, the whole tribes went to the Taliban. <laughs> it's been again and again the case, you know. What the Special Forces has done, for example, in Zabul, uh, Ghazni area, 
you know, it's, it's the most, the, this level of strategic stupidity is really, it's a serious problem. Giving arms to Azara against Pashtun. I mean, the two, the two ethnic groups are some kind of conflict. In this area, they are in conflict. You know, the disaster has been created in 2003, 4, 5. And after it was, it was, it was a mess. It was already a mess. So for this reason, and we can go in details, you know, my feeling is that's a bit too late. Uh, <laughs> I don't know uh, who was the, okay. Hmm. I'm sorry, it's not very, yes, please. First of all, um, I thought you, your presentation is uh, bordering on brilliance. <clears throat> and perhaps part of why I think it's brilliant is because it encapsulated everything that I believe <laughs> and everything that I've read. But unfortunately, I feel even though you agree with everything that I thought, I'm more depressed now than I was when I began. That being said, I think it's useful to get back to why we are there in the first place. I personally would rather visit a proctologist than to send an American army into Afghanistan. But we did because we were attacked by Al-Qaeda in the United States, organized from bases, at least partially, in Afghanistan. That's my understanding. Although they have other bases in other places, they're an international organization, they had camps, and that's why we're there to begin with. So, how wedded, if we do make a deal somehow with the Taliban, how confident are you, because I'm not, that when the Taliban comes back in, not only will we see the same things of summary executions at soccer games, <clears throat> The total abolition of all women's rights, it will turn back into what it was. Plus, Al-Qaeda will at some point, whether on the first day, the second day, two weeks, a month, return with them in some degrees, perhaps a little in the beginning, but then gradually more and more. So with that in mind, it's a very depressing situation for me. I think we need to end the question. Okay, uh, I agree with the, the depressing, um, I mean, it's depressing, but uh, actually, in a way, I, I, I don't feel comfortable when people are saying, okay, but uh, what you're saying is depressing, because when I was saying that in 2002, three, I was saying, okay, come on, guys, the Taliban are back. Nobody was listening, you know? So basically, I'm not saying something very different from what I've said uh, since 2002 or three. you know. In 2003, it was clear the Taliban were back. So, of course, it's an it's end game. It's like in a chess, you know. The chess, it's, when it's end game, it's not very exciting. You know that mostly you can get not much because we, we, have the, we, are, we are losing. So you're probably right. I mean, it's a risk. But what's the alternative? It's not that I'm sure it's going to work. I'm just saying, if not that, so then what? And here I don't have an answer. I don't see any reasonable way of beating the Taliban on the ground. I'm seeing that Karzai is just disintegrating. I mean, that's key problem. You cannot go out of Afghanistan without an Afghan state. And Karza is destroying, and we are destroying what could be an Afghan state. So the conclusion, we need another way out. And here, I have two observations. First, we are speaking about real loss. Real loss of life, money. It's over $1 trillion. Uh, while lives, it's probably over 700 this year. So it's real. On the other hand, you have risk that are not real for the moment. It's just risk, you know. And then you can say, okay, 
if I stop spending hundred of or billions, uh, hundred of billions of dollars every year in Afghanistan, maybe I could do something about Al Qaeda. If I'm not uh, uh, fighting a war in Afghanistan, that is a clear argument for Al Qaeda to recruit people everywhere. Maybe then, you know, you should not consider that the war is just a way to fight Al Qaeda because the war is reinforcing Al Qaeda. So. If you take all that out of the picture and you make a deal with uh, uh, serious guarantees, that could be Pakistanis, that could be uh, a clear authorization to strike in Afghanistan, a few bases in the north of Afghanistan to strike selectively people. If you have all that, I think the risk is, is, is possible. The problem, the cultural problem in the state is that the idea that you have to live with risk is just seems to be crazy. You know, look the reaction about... Uh, this guy for Christmas, you know, we tried to, to, to blow the plane. I mean, it's totally crazy. I mean, the guy was alone. He tried. He could have succeeded. But it's not a strategic threat. How many Americans died in the United States of terrorism since 2001? It's, very, I mean, it's a very low number. It's 15. I mean, we have to accept that there is a level of risk. And uh, what we are doing now is much more risky than the other alternative. So no, it's not perfect. No, but life is not perfect. So Taliban is now in Yemen very solidly. So from Yemen, you could have a new, a new attack on the state. Yes, it's possible. But now in the rational world, you have to live with it and to take some measures that are a way to limit the risk. There is no other way, I think. One more, or maybe two questions, and I will uh, wrap. OK. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, I agree with uh, with you. Um, but what what I wanted to ask you and to shift from from the military and, and this focus on Karzai and quite to ask you if you do see some brightness in the Afghan political scene. Is, um, I can say now if we take a look, uh, there, 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 is, there, there are rumblings and, and uh, expansion of civil society in Afghanistan. There are over 86 different political parties. And then we see the, the debacle of the election um, with Karzai finally reigning triumphant. But what, what I saw is with the uh, the problem that he had going through his cabinet, that there was pressure uh, from the parliament okay. and the people to say, enough is enough. We want these people out. We want these, these people. So on okay. that level is. Uh, I want to take another question. So another question, but quick. Yeah, you, you had a question? Oh, me, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I'm sorry. I'm, I want to distract you from the grand strategic and ethical issues. But you said that um, and in some circumstances, um, folks will go to Kabul and be out of the political scene. And I'm wondering if you could expand on that, because I don't quite understand what you meant. And is that something that happened with the US occupation, or the Soviet occupation, or the British occupation? Why, why is Kabul yeah, okay. absent? That's okay. The last one, but really the last one. Yeah, I want no, no last question. <laughs> OK. Um, was the invasion, with its goals as stated, doomed from the start? <laughs> okay. Uh, so the, 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 the brightness, um, I mean, it's, 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 it's becoming kind of, uh, of joke between us because uh, do you have good news? <laughs> well, <laughs> and uh, mostly no. Uh, so very quickly, uh, first, 80 political parties is actually no political parties. Uh, except the Taliban. The Taliban, the only real political party in Afghanistan, that's a major problem. So if there was one thing that, that we should have done is create political party. You kind of the, the, think about Germany. In, German, uh, in Germany, basically, you cannot do politics without a political party. We should have said, OK, you want to go to the election, you must belong to a political party. Political party is the key. It's not there. Second, yes, the parliament was nice. You have few liberals in the parliament. The game is complicated as usual, but a few drug dealers, a few... What, but, I mean, something was interesting there. But, as you know, 
the parliament is finished. In September, there is elections. It's over. Uh, uh, in six months, there is no more parliament in Afghanistan. The, the, the political system, I mean, we are in a post-democratic Afghanistan. It's very clear. And about the, the, the civil society, NGOs, whatsoever, don't forget first that NGOs are, for the most part, uh, just a way to get money from the Westerners. We have, we have built a huge uh, corruption system in Afghanistan, and NGOs are part of that. Some are very honest, but local Afghan NGOs are sometimes uh, quite borderline. And second, uh, with the growing level of violence, people tend to be extremely careful about what they say, what they think. You go outside the center of Kabul, you know, everybody has a burqa. I mean, every, all the women, uh, they, they have a burqa. I mean, you know, the, 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 the veil. Veil is everywhere, so if you think about that, even if I don't think it's a main problem in Afghanistan. But the schools, there is no more schools in, the, in plenty of places. Less than 50% of Afghan kids can go to school. And in this 50%, uh, I think the girls are clearly a minority. So you have the deconstruction of the civil society that is very quick now. So I would say on a practical level, if there is this kind of negotiation, uh, we should, uh, we, I mean more the, 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 the people than the governments, we should push the, the uh, NGOs in Kabul to work together and to be part of the negotiation to try to save something. It's probably possible. Second question is about, I, I was thinking about a um, very precise situation actually. In Helmand, uh, when the Taliban became extremely strong, uh, a, local lo a lot of local uh, militia commander, could be also police chief, all these guys were very corrupted, were killed by the Taliban, and a few others were elected. Uh, Arun Zada, for example, who is part of the big uh, drug dealer family of Helmand, they were elected. Uh, Arun Zada became senator. That is quite funny if you know his biography. And uh, he stayed in Kabul, but it was out of business because you have to be in this kind of situ situation. You have to be there to, to, to have power. You cannot, the remote control doesn't work very well in Afghanistan. You have to be on the ground. And so Arun Zada was not able to go there because it's too dangerous. And to give you an example, uh, Ismail Khan, the, the, the strong man of Erat, at least the west part, the west part of Erat, is uh, trying to get back in a way. He's going to lose his position in the government. He lost, actually, his position in the government. And the Taliban is trying to kill him very seriously. It's three attempts uh, against uh, his life the last two or three months. And so the question is, can you deal with Erat from Kabul? I don't think so. You have to be in Erat. And you have to be in Erat. You, I mean, there is a real probability you're going to be killed. That was the kind of thing I was, uh, was thinking about. Okay. And uh, the, the, the third question was about, uh, well, it's complicated. Actually, I think there was a moral right to, to, to destroy al -Qaeda, to go in Afghanistan and destroy Al-Qaeda. I think there, it, was, it, it was morally right. Legally speaking, it was borderline. Right? Contrary to what people think, it's... Uh, it's, uh, it's a clear departure from what was the international uh, laws. Because, for example, the United States was supporting some groups in Central America, and the idea that somebody could retaliate directly in the United States was not accepted. Uh, the idea even that the United States was responsible for the contrast because the contrast was supported by the United States was not accepted in internationally. So you see this kind of situation where... Um, you know that you have a right to do it, but uh, legally it's a little bit ambiguous. The second thing is the way it was done, it was bad because you have two strategies. Rumsfeld wanted to go north. He wanted to, to redo Kosovo. Uh, you know, U.S. Uh, bombing the Taliban and a few local forces helping. It was Kosovo. I mean, the, the strategic plan is Kosovo. At the same time, uh, Colin Powell, of course, uh, was both uh, cleverer and uh, in a weak position inside the government, and he wanted to deal with the Pakistanis. The, the dream, Powell, uh, Powell's dream was, okay, we are going to, to work with the 
Pashtun, the southern forces of Afghanistan, because the northern alliance is, is weak. That was the idea. And he was right, actually. So he tried to do something, but the, 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 it was too fast. Remember that the 15, it must be around the 15th uh, of September, uh, the official line of the US government was, we don't want a war with the, with the Taliban. The Taliban are perfectly respectable. We just want uh, bin Laden. And where maybe there was a possibility is that Mullah Omar was open to, to the idea of giving bin Laden to a third Muslim country. And it would have been a, a good solution. Because at least for me in 2001, I was uh, well, first totally insomniac for some time uh, and sure that it was a catastrophe. I mean, we were going straight to a catastrophe. It was very clear for me because I knew the, uh, I was doing a lot of field work with the Taliban. I knew a little bit, it was not right. But if you are going to Afghanistan, then you have first to kill bin Laden. So you have to send US forces to kill bin Laden, not local Afghan <laughs> militia, of course, who took the money. I mean, come on. Uh, nobody wants to, to be responsible of the death of bin Laden for different reasons. But well, you can make money, so they, they made money. Uh, you have to kill bin Laden, and you have to, to, to capture or kill, but capture would have been better, capture Mullah Omar. It was not done. And then it was the light, uh, light print uh, strategy, so no troops, the border totally open, the Pakistanis supporting the Taliban. I mean, after 2003, it was over. The level of incompetence inside the, U the, the, the U.S. government was such that I think it was over. Just a prime, I mean, competence matters. Uh, <laughs> well. That will be that will be my my last uh, my last word tonight. <laughs> Thank you very much. The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is a collaborative project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies and the International House Global Voices Program. The World Beyond the Headlines series aims to bring scholars and journalists together to consider international news stories and how these stories are covered. As a listener, you have come to rely on this program for in-depth analysis of major issues facing our country and our world. But we can only continue our nationally recognized coverage with support from you. Secure the future of World Beyond the Headlines programming by making your gift online at alumniservices.uchicago.edu slash giving. Please specify World Beyond the Headlines as the area of giving. The World Beyond the Headlines series is supported by the McCormick Foundation, the Norman Wade Harris Fund, and from generous contributions from listeners like you.